Oh yeah. Hey yo, it's the Russo Show. Hey yo, it's the Russo Show. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Pizza Film School. I'm Joe Russo. Anthony Russo. And we are here at uh, Agbo headquarters in downtown Los Angeles, as you can see. Uh, our pizza today is Oste, which is uh, located on West 3rd near uh, Beverly Grove. Fantastic pizza. It's not gluten-free, but it is gluten-light, and the crust is mm. excellent. I've never had gluten-light before. <laughs> it's very That's good. That's a good combo. Yeah. Give it a shot. All right. Our guest today is a dear, dear friend of ours. We're, we're partners uh, in a commercial uh, production company called Bullet. Uh, he and I went to film school together in the, in the mid-90s. I'm not trying to date either one of us, uh, but, uh, but we, we did go to film school uh, two and a half decades ago. Uh, it's the incredible uh, Justin Lin. Justin, welcome to Pizza Film School. Thanks for having me. Uh, where are you right now? Uh, I'm, I'm in my office right now. Um, this is where I write, and uh, we're hopefully uh, in a couple of years I'm moving out of this space to our new space. So. That's great. And what, what pizza are you eating today, Justin? Uh, you guys sent over some pizza. I ha I'm going to have it, I guess, off air. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry about it. Some we, people, some people prefer to eat off air. Most I, people. I eat on yes. air. So I'm just going to try a little bit more of this. <laughs> and Pizza Film School is a way, hopefully, to democratize the notion of film school. This is free. We're trying to share as much information as we can for the audience around the world. People who may not have access to a film school can't afford film school. You know, nobody gives you a handbook as a director on how to become a director. And I think that every director, their process is like their fingerprint. It's a unique identity because no, no two processes are exactly the same. Um, and different directors tend to focus on different issues. Some are visual, some are story driven, some like thematic, some like plot, some like twists, some like emotion, drama, comedy. So it's a very, you know, it's your personality that really defines who you are as a director. We're going to talk today about uh, Better Luck Tomorrow, which is the movie that launched your career uh, almost 20 years ago. Yeah, we thought, we thought this would be a good movie to speak about process on because it was such a difficult movie to get made, such an unlikely movie to get made. And the fact that you pulled it off uh, really speaks to the fact that you must have had a really sound process. Uh, I know you were improvising a lot as you went through it, but it's yeah. still at the same time, you had to have a, a real grounding and a real focus uh, in order to get a movie like this made. It was such a phenomenon, such a remarkable movie. And I know, you've, I know it's been explored many times uh, by interviewers with you, but I, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us just to simply talk about, hopefully in a, in a way you haven't spoken about uh, as often, just simply, what was your process as a director in getting the movie made, regardless of, of a lot of the larger questions that usually get focused on with the movie? You know, it's interesting because I, I, I was in grad school, you know, and um, I, I, had, I was very fortunate and I went to undergrad at UCLA and it was a two year program. And, you know, especially back in the 90s, you're shooting everything on 16 millimeter and you're cutting on, on flatbeds and everything. Um, but I think all film students, you, you get so hungry, you want to learn and grow, but it's a, that was a, another generation, right? Like, because every idea you have, you have to like, you know the cost that's associated with it, right? So like, I, I still remember sitting there in the cutting room and you're, you're like, should I take two frames off or not on the flatbed? And then you take a break, go downstairs and think about it. And like that process was like something that I, 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 I know I romanticize and I love, but it also was so hard back then in, in trying to figure out how to tell a story, but then getting the money to hopefully help you tell that story. Um, that was like, that was my experience in, in film school. And the, the great thing about UCLA at the time was that they really try to help you find your point of view in things, you know? And it, it was like a wild, wild west, you know, like you, you I, I was lucky because I was, you know, I grew up in a working class family. so. I, I, I really enjoyed DPing other people's film, but it, for me, it was free, you know, and I got to like learn and, and, 
And it was a really great experience of, of just get immersing myself. So when I finally decided, okay, well, I think I'm ready to be a filmmaker. What, what do I do? It became very clear to me from all my experience, both in, in undergrad and, and, and grad school, it became very clear that it had to really kind of explore issues that was important to me because that probably might be it. Like I really did feel like I might only have one shot at this. And I think from it, sometimes you, you would expect to feel stressed out or, but it actually was very liberating, you know, when, when that was what was driving uh, on what story to tell, you know, and then trying to tell that story was a whole other, <laughs> it was a whole other journey. Um, but, but to me that, that UCLA kind of aligned with me in the sense that I didn't know what I wanted to do. I tried film school and I got there and they, they were just there to try to help you find your point of view. Um, even though there was no one way and you, you ask 30 students, they're all exploring in, in their own different way. What was the very first step you took toward making this movie? Was it the script or was it, was there an idea? There, there was three ideas. So I had, I had three ideas. And again, I went through the exercise of, okay, um, because I, I had made a, a indie film with my friend Quentin Lee when I was an undergrad. And he's Canadian, so th the reason that got financed was we had this idea and um, he applied for a grant. And the, so I learned so much from that one experience that, you know, how brutal it is. Like, you can make a movie, it doesn't mean anybody's going to watch it, you know? And, and it's just like there's a whole other journey to, to the movie after you make it. And so for me, I had three ideas. I would say the other two apply more genre kind of uh, uh, inherent. And it very quickly, it felt like, oh, that's something I can explore if I'm lucky enough to do it later in life. Bear Like Tomorrow, um, you know, it, it was actually an idea. It was something that happened uh, not far from where I grew up, which is uh, in Fullerton. There was a Sunny Hills murder. I was in college and, and it was this big story. And uh, Ernesto, who I went to film school with, we were, he grew up in Orange County too, and we would talk about it, and he was researching it. And that was that, it was at that point that I think after talking about it for a bit, that I felt like, wow, this is something that I haven't seen. It's something that really intrigued me, like dealing, like trying to explore this identity, this issue of identity, you know, but through an Asian American lens. That's what kind of became very clear that that had to be the story. It was critical to you to tell an emotionally resonant, um story, uh, because I think this is important for young filmmakers to understand, right? Because we do say this a lot, is that it's very hard to work on material that you're not emotionally connected to, right? So if you try to predict what an audience wants, you're probably gonna get in a lot of trouble because you're not gonna believe in what you're doing, and if they don't believe it, then nobody believes in it. So we've found that you know the, the best litmus for us is, is this a story that we wanna get out of bed every day to tell? And if it is, then you hope that other people resonate with that story, but they're not gonna resonate without that emotional core to it. So it was critical to you to tell something very personal and something that had strong uh, um, emotional uh, connection uh, uh, to your life at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, to, to me, it was interesting because I think, uh, again, kind of growing up working class, when I got to college, you take like all these different classes and they talked about uh, ethnic identity and searching for identity. And these are all writings from, I think, like the 70s and 60s, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, I kind of, I get it. It's college and I, I'm, I'm, I, I enjoy it. But then when an incident like this happened, I started thinking, wow, are they searching for identity or are they shopping for identity? So it was an exploration of, of that that really intrigued me. And you're right, like, I look back now and, and you know, yes, indie films are super hard to make because they're usually not commercial, but it's usually because you are connected to it on an emotional level. I mean, the hardest thing is making these big budget movies and trying to make it organic and make everyone uh, uh, feel like they're stakes, like real stakes. That's the, that is the biggest challenge, I think, having gone through this whole journey. So um, I think it all started from that, from Bear Look Tomorrow. It, it became very clear to me that if I had one shot, that's the, you know, that's the theme that I wanted to explore. That's really fascinating too, because it was so, because it had that personal layer to you. you you're, what you're saying is like, you know, people can look at you and look at this movie and feel like you have a special vision for it. 
that they can sign on to and they can support because it's so unique to you as a filmmaker. I think that's very interesting. Did you ever uh, end up making those other two ideas that you had at the time? No, they're still in development. <laughs> It is funny, like they, they, you kind of siphon off ideas. I, I, you guys probably know, right? Like, I, I would, if I go back to those two ideas, I'd be like, oh yeah, I think I might have ripped that off in Fast Five, and you started using it in other works, and soon it's just like a skeleton of an idea. You, you picked it over. All that's left are the bones at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, we, uh, we know that story for sure. Script writing process for you. So when you're working on a script with a writer, uh, what's that process like? Do you is it very formal? Do you get in rooms and have conversations over coffee? Several conversations over coffee? Is it meticulous? Do you spend months before you go to script? Do you like to get the script done quickly and then go back and revise it? What's your process like on that front? I would say it was, you know, nothing's ever the same from my experience, but I think on that one, um, I had uh, Ernesto who, when the idea came up, it was us talking and it was through his research that kind of got it going. And then uh, Fabian Marquez, who I went to, you know, I've known him my whole life and he was working at New Line at the time. And we decided we were all going to come together and try to write the script together. And it was, I would say it was like um, probably four months of just kind of chaos because we were three different human beings trying to figure out how to work together. And obviously, you know, everybody had their day jobs and and um, I, aside from going to school, I was also working at this museum downtown, you know, and uh, the best thing I did was once I felt like I knew what the movie was, like just the spine of it, I took my vacation days and I went to Vegas by myself. And I, I had heard that, you know, they pump oxygen in the rooms and all that stuff. So I, I thought, why, why don't I just go to a hotel room and lock myself in a room and, uh, and just write, you know? And so it ended up being the best thing for the project because we had four months of trying all these things, talking about characters, and it, it just felt so out of control that I was able to go to Vegas and then I, I, I stayed at the Fitzgerald downtown for 10 bucks a night and it was, <laughs> I did four nights and I, it was awesome. I just kind of was writing and I think those four nights really kind of galvanized everything because when I got back, I shared it with Ernie and Fabe, and they both looked at it and go, oh, and we connected. And I think all the great work kind of came from that, you know, and it was, it was four months of just not knowing what to do, then like really being focused. That to me became like the, the draft that we worked the movie off of. Do you follow story structure in any way? Do you like a three act structure? Like what's your process on that front? Or is it more improvisational for you by instinct? It's, it's always that balance of, of, of hopefully having both, you know, I, I, I tend to kind of start a little bit on the three act structure because, you know, usually an idea is exciting to you for a reason. That's what sets the, initiates the journey. And usually when that happens, you should be able to figure out the mirror, which is the third act. And then you dive in and really kind of explore all the stuff in the second act, which is usually where, where I have a lot of problems. And that's when I go into the five act structure with Ernie um, which is more character based and that helps it helps me navigate and, and kind of find um, ways to hopefully not not only help the uh, the characters but but the overall kind of thematic arc for, for the film you're, you're very big on theme I mean we Ant and I, I remember when we first got Winter Soldier you had uh, already been working on the Fast and Furious franchise and we called you up and said hey do you mind if we come over and talk to you a little bit about commercial filmmaking. This is, you know, we've been working on Arrested Development Community and these oddball comedies, and we wanted to get our heads around it. And we came, came by your office and chatted for an hour or two. And I remember the most resonant thing you talked about was, for us, this notion of theme. The theme has to drive the story. And if you look at that franchise, theme is incredibly important to it. The theme of family is critically important, and it, it it, it's pulled through, you know, all of the films. Talk a little bit about your connection to theme and why theme is so important to you. The, the theme to me is linked to, with, you know, my point of view on, on any story. And I, this kind of, uh, I think this probably come off of like, you know, I think when we're in film school, you know, sometimes you just hang out with a bunch of other film students and you talk about like point of view, right? And, and the, the thing for me was, 
I remember way back in films when we would sit and talk about that, and you you think about like a, a, a franchise like James Bond, where it's usually kind of very similar in the in structure, and 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 what can you bring to it that's going to be special? And and to me, that's theme and 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 you know, thematic exploration, and also that obviously touches the the characters, you know. And and I, I always feel like. You know, it doesn't matter if it's something that's very personal or something that's very artificial that's being world building. Um, you, we have to have something to say. And that's my first step into trying to engage and connect with the material. Justin, at what point did you start thinking about making the movie, the production? Was it after you had a script you, you were in love with or was it at some point earlier than that? How did you approach thinking about ma making the film? Wow, I mean, I think for, for me way back then, it, it, it was like, it's this kind of crazy thing that, that I think we have to possess as filmmakers, is this irrational confidence, you know? And it's, it's like, it's this balance of being able to say, I'm gonna do it no matter what, but at the same time, you have to be able to check yourself, you know? And so I think I, I, on Bear Luck Tomorrow, I, I felt like I was at that point, you know? I had gone to undergrad, I went to grad school, and I, I felt like I was ready, you know? And, and it is one of those things when I talk to young filmmakers, I, I feel like it's so crucial to be able to check yourself too, right? To be able to say, hey, I put in the work, I think I'm ready to go now. Because if, you, if I would have said, I wanna make Fairlock Tomorrow two years earlier, I know for sure I wouldn't be able to execute, you know? But for some reason, I just felt like, all right, I, I, I've done all these things, I, I, am, I get this one shot, I'm gonna try for it. And so when I committed to it, it very much was um, during even the, the writing process, I just felt like this is going to be the film that I'm going to make. And this might be the only film that I make in my life. And that's OK. And that, so I, I, I approached it, you know, in a way I had to learn the business side, how to find, you know, not only, you know, take 10 credit cards, but I started an LLC, a PPM. I, I don't know how to do any of that, but I, I loved it so much that I had to teach myself and then go to like talk to this entertainment lawyer and how to set up all these things and and like how many shares you're going to sell. I mean, it, it's definitely not what I'm, I'm born to do, but I, I loved it so much. I had to go and learn that. What we think is amazing today is that, you know, a lot of the costs of a movie like Better Luck Tomorrow could be mitigated because of technology. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, students today or aspiring filmmakers today have access to an incredible camera on the iPhone and apps that can help you uh, um, uh, with the color temperature uh, of, uh, of what you're shooting. Filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh shooting entire movies on an iPhone using available light to do it. Uh, you can actually tell your story for a lot less money uh, than we could. Uh, you know, we made pieces in, in uh, 94 through 97. You shot Better Luck Tomorrow, I think, in, in 2000, 2001, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and today, that you know, I think there's less barrier of entry. Plus, they also have free distribution, right? They can put it on the internet. They can show it on YouTube, right? They, they can find an audience. You know, we always encourage young filmmakers to just get out there and make things with their iPhones, get your friends to act. Um, uh, in it, uh, tell your stories, uh, just get, get to work. Like you said, you put the work in to do it. So the more, you know, we also make this correlation to carpentry with filmmaking is, you know, you want to be a great carpenter, you got to make a lot of tables. You want to be a great filmmaker, you're going to have to make a lot of movies. You got to shoot a lot of stuff. Talk a little bit about your casting process on Better Luck Tomorrow. How did you approach that? Because it's a historic cast. You, you launched a lot of careers with the film. It's a, it's a landmark movie, culturally uh, a, a, um, a landmark film as well um, for Asian Americans. So talk about your, the, the casting of that film. I look back now and I, 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 I kind of laugh because I was trying really hard not to let the, all the bullshit get into the process because especially at that, you know, being in film school, right? I remember like you have friends that are casting for a short film and there would be like a character actor that like maybe he's doing a favor and they come and do it. But they they show up and they act like they're, you know, Tom Cruise or, you know, the biggest star in the world. And it hijacks the whole process, you know, and I that used to really bug me that like, you know, it's so hard for us to tell a story 
then you're at such an early like you know phase in your career, you're kowtowing to people who are coming in with ulterior uh, motives, right? And so I I made it really hard. I, I I stripped everything down, and I would have auditions at the soundstage at UCLA, and I would even do like improvs, and it was it was funny because it kind of weeded out all the all the people that were in, wanted to do it for the wrong reasons. I remember actors would come in and like, they would give me a hard time and say, they don't do improv. And I said, okay, it's okay. You don't have to do it. You go home. It's okay. You know? And, but in a way, looking back now, it, it really, for me, it weeded out all the, all the BS. I remember it was like, I think it was like a, one of the Power Rangers. She wanted to be in the movie, but it was like, she was demanding all these perks. I'm like, what are you talking about perks? <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, and so it made it easy for, for I think, for me. But I, I, looking back now, it was a, maybe I wasn't fully conscious, but it was probably one of the most important decisions I made was to make sure that no matter what, like, you know, we, we all have to kind of like get to know each other through the process so that, you know, we can hopefully make the best film possible. You know, and someone like John Cho, who I worked with before, he was awesome. Like I had him come in to read um, um, some scenes, even during audition, just to see if I can find the chemistry. So it, 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 looking back now, it was a great, it, it, it ended up being such a great decision. But I think back then, I, I think I was just tired of, of any kind of bullshit. And I was trying very hard to create a process where we can weed that out. That's fascinating. That's a very real problem that you're talking about. That was a, and that was a very smart way to move through that. How did you, you know, sort of, Taking that as, as, uh, as an example, how did you apply that to the rest of the crew, for instance? Because you had been working for many years at that point with an amazing film school community. You know, some of those relationships are sort of a matter of circumstance and some are, are something more than that, where you, where you strike stronger creative connections with people. How did you balance uh, the crew for the movie between that, that community of people you knew through film school versus who you could reach for on a professional level at that point? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. And I think it was very similar in, in approach. You know, I, I, I remember um, there was a, I was TAing and there was uh, this kid who, you know, you could tell he was just a great hard worker and just always wanted to learn. And, um, and he came on, but he didn't just show up and, and say, I'm gonna work on this project. Like we actually sat down, even though he, he ended up being a PA and I think he actually went up as we were shooting because he was so good. But I always kind of enjoy kind of connecting with them on story on why I want to make this movie. And I think that wasn't, you know, it definitely took time, but it really kind of helped. And I, I think on a professional level, we were all film students. I think even Patrice who was shooting the film, he was an AFI, you know, he had shot some documentary stuff for me. Um, so we were all very much at the same level, you know, and, uh, it, I knew it was going to be tough. I knew it was going to be like, I think it was like a 32 day shoot. Um, and we all had to be on it for the right reason. So I think the extra effort was being put in on making sure that it doesn't matter if you're the lead or you're the PA, we're all going to, you know, we're all going to engage on the same level, which is why are you here? You know, because there's no money. So you're here because we're trying to tell the story. We talk a little bit about cinematography because in film school, Justin and I were in the same class together and Part of UCLA's film school, and I think what attracted him to it and what attracted me to it was this do-it-yourself component where USC felt a little bit more polished. UCLA was a little bit more independent. But, you know, you were required to work on um, other students' films for them, so you would have to, you know, trade crew. Uh, so I would go be a gaffer on somebody's movie or DP or I'd run sound for them, and then they'd do the same for me. Everybody was always trying to get Justin a DP there films because he had this incredible gift for, or this amazing eye for um, cinematography. Uh, and he understood lighting. He was more advanced than uh, anyone else in our class at the time. Talk a little bit about like why, you know, you know how you came to that uh, place in your life, why you were so focused on the mise-en-scene. Better Luck Tomorrow is an incredibly stylish movie. It's beautifully stylish. And, and, um, and I found it to be very personal, having known you and your work. Um, talk a little bit about how you arrived at that point in your life uh, um, and had that love for photography and then how you applied that um, to Better Luck Tomorrow and how you applied to all your other movies. You know, it, it is one of those things that I, I give 
UCLA, the program, so much credit. I think when we were there, uh, the faculty, we were very fortunate. I think just having a lot of like real filmmakers, most of them from Eastern Europe, um, then they, I, I know there's something about it. It was so magical for me because when I look back now, they're obviously brilliant filmmakers, but also there was something about like, um, I don't know if maybe because English is their second language or whatever, but the way they taught, it was never condescending. That was something that I really was able to like latch onto and to be able to like really think through every beat like dramaturgically, but then also use every element that you can to try to help tell that story. That was always fascinating. And I think, again, just being having the opportunity to be able to shoot films with other filmmakers, you know, a lot of them, you know, they, they all do it differently, but, but there's, there's one that are just so focused on, um, performance and they're like, you just set up the shots and I'm like, okay, great. And it's, there's never a right or wrong way. But to me, those, those reps was so like, it was so important for me. You know, I, I look at filmmakers who could make a film every five years and they're brilliant and it blows me away, you know, but I know myself, like I, 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 I need to grind it out. I need to kind of learn the craft. And I think those years, undergrad and grad, you know, I, when I have the opportunity to make my movies, which is very rare because, you know, every film was like $4,000, which, you know, I was working three jobs trying to pay for it. Um, I, I definitely enjoy that, but I, I felt very fortunate to be able to be involved in other productions and be able to be in those conversations and how to tell those stories, you know. And, and most of the time it's because they're trying to tell this beat, but there's no time. And we have to tell it in like one frame. How do you do that? And so obviously that goes into lighting goes into uh camera moves and by the way i, I have just have to say i think uh joe you were you're transferring pieces in that you know like that that transfer room yeah that's right yeah i was watching with you and you guys had these dolly shots in that film that i was like oh my god i hope one day i can have a dolly shot like because back then you talk about technology and film it was so hard to achieve I was, I still, one of my best memories going in that transfer room and seeing your film and like, not only like it looked like a real film, but also just the, the style and the camera moves you guys were able to apply in that film. We had done it backwards. We had shot a movie and then gone to film school, but we were at film school to get money for, for to, to, finish, the to movie. finish the movie. <laughs> so we're using our student loans to finish it and also use the equipment at UCLA. Ended up having an incredible experience. We, we became great friends, so there's a lot of uh, value that came out of it, but that's part of the hustler mentality you talked about earlier of like, if you wanna make a movie, it's gonna take every drop of blood in your body to do it. And you gotta remember that there are a million other people out there who will spend that same amount of blood to get their movies made. And he was right in that, you know, it is a, you know, it is a labor of love. They're very difficult, it requires a lot of strategy, requires a lot of work, long hours. If you don't have that intrinsic passion or love for the art form, uh, you may not ever get to a place where you make better luck tomorrow, you know? Do you feel like you have certain rules that you follow with lenses, with lighting? Is there a way that, is there a reason, you know, what do you use to motivate movement with the camera? Just talk a little bit about, because we certainly have rules uh, about longer lenses versus wide lenses, et cetera. But talk a little bit about, you know, just from a process standpoint, how your brain works in respect to, you know, the camera as a tool. The, the, the class we took, Joe, uh, Yerzy's, Yerzy yeah. Edchek's class, the Fluid Master class, to me, that is still like, has been so influential for me. You know, I, I remember we were sitting there because in that class we had a, a dolly, we had a camera and a set of lenses. And then we had to like, one of the things we had to do was to like shoot this one scene, but the camera had to be motivated by, you know, by the characters and what's happening, the drama of the scene. And it was, it was such a great exercise for me, you know? And I, I, I think back at, in that class and where we just was, I think it was seven of us rotating and having to do everything. But the, the idea of just having that space and time to be able to, talk about and break down a scene and talk about, well, how would this look and, and what lens would we use and, and why, when do we move the camera and why? Um, I love, that to me is like, out of all my film school experience, that class um, like really kind of solidified like my philosophy and how I try to tell stories, you know? And, and I think earlier, um, 
I'd probably say I've obviously have kind of grown and evolved um, and like certain lenses that I hated when I was uh, younger. Now I'm like fully embracing, you know, um, I think part of it is just trying. Now I feel like I'm, I'm, I, I, I've, I'm more open to, to be able to kind of explore. So, you know, I used to have really strict rules. Now I feel like, you know, it obviously it's dependent on, on whatever the subject matter and the story that I'm trying to tell. And it's instinctual, right? Like you're, you're there on instinct looking at it going, that's not the right lens for this. You know, let's get a longer lens on, or if it's more improvisationally, it's like jazz improv. You've done it so much. You play this instrument for so long that you, 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 know, you, re, you rely on instinct more now than, than you do sort of a, 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 a premeditated dogma. Yeah, approach. I think so. I, I still enjoy kind of trying to set up certain rules to see if you can adhere by it. But I think the, the, the older I've gotten, you know, those rules are great to kind of, to, to be able to kind of connect everybody in how we can potentially tell a story. And it's so that, you know, people who are suggesting things who are very talented that we work with, they're not also working in a vacuum, you know? But yeah, you're right. Like now that I've, I'm older, I, I do feel like there's just certain things that when I look at it, I just know exactly, I don't, that's not right. We can't do this. And, and it, those are nice moments to have because it feels like, great, like I, I'm still growing. I, hopefully I'm a better filmmaker today than I was yesterday. <laughs> Oh yeah.